Well, this evening we're going to do the, the time is in a different way. Because I think I want to talk first about the fact that um, except for specialists, very few people get into the time is. Because the time is, is a cosmology. And a cosmology is a theory about how the universe was generated. Well, when you consider that we're talking about 4th century B.C. or 5th century B.C. physics, trying to explain how the universe was generated, you can certainly see why moderns would prefer to go into science and modern science to try to explain how the universe was generated since obviously we have a greater scope of knowledge in terms of physics and chemistry and all the other sciences that can give an account of how the universe was generated. It's one of the major concerns of physicists and theoretical physicists today. So therefore, the idea of Plato's Timaeus is for the most part ignored. Now there's also in the Timaeus some metaphysics so there's also metaphysics in it. And uh, if you have a universe that's being generated, and the generation is based upon certain metaphysical principles, obviously it's not going to have too much currency in today's world. We don't think that way. Well, behind the cosmology is also a theology. That is to say there's a God in the time is that in fact brings about the cosmology or the universe and equally well the kind of God depicted in the time is while it has certain interesting aspects there are many people today that aren't too concerned with theology either <laughs> therefore for a good number of reasons it can be ignored or forgotten so why should we now return to this well let me pr propose a curious thing um, what if Plato is only secondarily interested in how the universe was generated? And what he's really interested in, why it was generated. Not how, but why. Suppose further that his goal is not just the generation of the universe, but suppose his goal is to explain how man can be in a universe in which he can know himself and the universe. And in knowing both, and in knowing both, and isolating the factors that brought that knowing and made that knowing possible, he can then develop a certain set of principles which can be used not only to explain how he can know himself in the universe, but how the set of principles can be said to be the primary principles for creation itself or the cosmology. Let me do it again. Suppose Plato is not just exploring how the universe was generated, but why? 
And suppose in that why, what he really seeks to explain is how it is that man can be in a universe in which he knows himself and can know himself and the universe, and in knowing that, recognize there are a certain set of principles, prior principles, which can be used in a, as a set of principles that can explain how metaphysically the universe can be created, not physically, but metaphysically how the universe can be created. Therefore, it's an entirely different kind of cosmology I'm now going to explore. What is it? We're not going to be talking about how the physical universe came into existence. That's only secondary. What we want to see is that set of principles which once recognized can be used to explain right, the conditions necessary for the universe to come into existence. The conditions, not the causes. The conditions for the universe being generated at all. Now, when you try to explain the conditions for something, you're getting behind the causes. Because the cause of a fire, or lighting a match, or the flame igniting, is different than the conditions for that fire being ignited. Right? You have to have oxygen, you have to have a supply of fuel, and et cetera, et cetera. Right? So the conditions are always prior to the cause. Let's go further. Suppose we decide then that these conditions, explaining these conditions for the universe from a set of principles, can be understood as the first principles in a metaphysics. Well, if that's the case, then you're going to have a metaphysics that's going to rest on a set of principles, which are going to be the conditions for explaining how the universe was generated. But more importantly, it's going to be the same set of principles going to explain how it is you're in a universe where you can know yourself as well as the universe. We could really do this in another way, you see. We could take the timeus in front of us and we could take the scissors and cut out everything in the timeus that deals with how the physical universe is generated. Just cut it out. Then we'd have two piles. We'd have a stack of material dealing with the physical generation of the universe and something else. That something else happens to be those set of principles which are metaphysical, which can account for how man can know himself of the universe. That's what we would have. Now, thank goodness, someone has already done this. And therefore, we don't have to start by inventing the metaphysical wheel. Now, Proclus did a commentary on Plato's time is. And let me say something about it first. For many years, it was very difficult to get Proclus because the only person who had been translating his works was Thomas Taylor back in the very early 19th century, 1805 and thereabout. And therefore, when those of us wanted to study Proclus, we tried to get a copy of Thomas Taylor's commentary and then run down to some Photoshop and make copies of it. And therefore, we would have these big tomes, thick and ponderous tomes of Plato's commentaries by Proclus. And I brought there's a two-volume set of it, and this is, this is the first. This is why philosophers invariably are strong, <laughs> build up their bodies, because <laughs> this is volume two of uh, Commentaries of Proclus on Plato's Timaeus. And uh, as you can see, only one page is printed, and that line represents the cutting edge of the Xerox machine. Right. So this is the way we... Now, it's out now, 
in a uniform edition, and you can now buy it, and buy Heaven's Your Way Ahead. So, uh, again, if you want to go into this much further, this is really an introduction to Plato's Time Is, and I'm relying to some degree on Proclus' comments. And uh, I like talking about Proclus because he is a mystery. He's the biggest mystery to me in philosophy. And this is the mystery. He takes Plato's Timaeus, which is a very compact work, and he takes nearly every single sentence and can find in that sentence a whole metaphysics. So he unpacks it and explains it in hundreds and more pages like that two-volume work I have there on the table. Now, what is, why am I saying it's a mystery? Well, it's a mystery because when you begin to see the profundity of what Proclus is doing with some of Plato's dialogues, especially the time is, he did one on the Republic, by the way, which doesn't exist anymore except in uh, small sections. If you take a look at what he did with Plato's time is, you'll be amazed at how much is behind it because Proclus uh, brings into his work all of the thinkers that came between himself, major thinkers that came between himself and Plato, nearly all of whom we don't have any text for anymore. So therefore he brings a living tradition of a thousand years along with him in this ride, showing the commentary on Plato's time is. And it's, the mystery therefore is quite simple. If it is true that Proclus' commentary really reveals the thought of Plato, then the thought of Plato must be so terribly profound to have contained so much so compactly that it really defies the imagination to consider that anyone could be so profound and so magnificent in the way he treats the subject as to require scholars for the next thousand years to unpack it all. Therefore, if you have a chance, get a copy. So, let me now work backwards then, and then we'll work forwards. The particular passage that I would like to work on is the nature of the soul. And it presents some very interesting, very interesting, um, constructions. And it starts, therefore, at 34C about, so just keep that number in mind. You can check any translation of Plato. And he really begins his comment. He puts a paragraph. He talks about it in a variety of ways. But he jumps in at 35A, and I'm going to just read you the quote, midway between being, which is indivisible and remains always the same, and the being which is transient and divisible in bodies, he blended a third form of being compounded out of the two, that is to say, of the same and other. And so, what we're looking now at is an explanation of what's the soul? Well, it looks like then it's a mean, it's a, it's a mixture of two things. It's a mixture of a being, two kinds of being, this is impartable. You cannot break it into parts. And this is partable. This is always the same. And this is always different or other, same word, different other. And by bringing these together, and he stirs them together with being, to create a mean between these two. Now, 
it's nice that we know that, except for one thing. And that is, what does he mean by this word? Now, this is a good word we've been playing around for quite a while. And let's see if we can go into Plato and bring it out. Okay, now, we're going to talk now about uh, the, the most interesting metaphysics of Plato. Now, when I talk about metaphysics, I want to put over here a challenge. Is it possible that is it possible that his metaphysics also represents states of mind open to man? So if so, then you can look at it simultaneously as the highest kind of reflection, as well as the kind of highest kind of reflection applicable to man's states of mind, or highest states of mind. Or the higher we go, let's even say the higher we go into this metaphysics, the purer the concept, the higher the states of mind we go into, the more we're talking about spiritual states of mind, or yogic states of mind, or transpersonal psychological states of mind. So therefore, that's our challenge. So let's go back into it. The highest term in the Platonic universe is the one, also called the good. And they are said to be identical. And I think we once went through a beautiful proof of the fact that they can be said to be the same. And that, of course, is Proclus's great 13th proposition in his Elements of Theology. So let's leave that for a moment. Now, okay, what can you say about the one or the good? Well, according to metaphysics, you can't say anything about it, because all remember all the statements you make about it are in fact, um, in fact, don't approach the uh, majesty of the concept. It always delimits it in some way. The only concept he has in the Parmenides, where he talks about the one in the first hypothesis, is that it is unlimited. Now, Plato in the Philebus, another dialogue, he says, you know, what first emerged, if you want to talk about this metaphysically from the one, the first things you can say about the one that follow from it are it's unlimited or, as he calls it, uh, the unlimited or the infinite. And the fact that you are, in some way, you're talking about something, no matter how grand and majestic, in that sense it's also bound. Right. That is to say, there must be a bond about it. So therefore, this is the highest concept. This is the second derived from it, unlimited and bound. Now, anything that's unlimited and bound, to say anything at all about it, if you say that it is, then of course you're, you're bringing in the notion of being. So, when you talk about this unlimited and bound as if it has being, then you must talk about it as uh, something that, that, that uh, Primary, primary category is going to have to be permanency, right? It must stay within that bond, permanency. All right, permanency. And yet the idea of unlimited is expansiveness, right? Expansiveness. 
a series of numbers, unlimited number, infinite number, is, is uh, theoretically motion. Right? Permanency and impermanency are motion. As permanency can be, in contrast, can be talked about as in perfect rest. But for it, you know, to it for it to have this quality, there's one thing you have to say about it. Uh, see, talk about permanency. What follows from that very idea of permanency must be same, sameness, or same idea of same. And when you talk in a similar way of something. In motion, always in motion, difference. So these are the five, this is the highest concept. Right? This is what naturally follows from it. If this is said, then this can be said. And therefore, these are called the five genera. Right, but for first five things that you can be that can be said in any way to be once you assert that there is something unlimited and bound. Pierre, can you explain this is bound or having difficulty? Well, if it's unlimited, you are talking about something that has some kind of you're doing something. You're it has some what do you want to call it? You have defined it. You have, it's, you know, it's unlimited. Oh, must have a boundary. That's a concept, must have a boundary. Well, see, if you have an infinite series of numbers, right, that may not have any last term, naturally enough, right? But you can talk about numbers, and therefore it is bounded in the sense as you can talk about number as a class, a class of infinite number of members, bound, infinite. Good, good, good. So, <laughs> All right. Are you saying that the, the, the one uh, is at the same time unlimited, unlimited and, and bound? The first things you can say about it, first things you can say about it, when you recognize it, it is inadequate, are these two terms. Therefore, in thinking and trying to understand the universe, if there is a highest, if there is a highest, these two terms would follow. If these two terms can be said to follow, these follow quickly after. I think this gentleman again, in, our, in my mind, I, I wonder uh, if bound can follow. Well, bond mean bound or uh, uh, boundary. How about boundary? Is this not saying something? Uh-oh. Not something else? Then you put some kind of fence around it. Well, let me tell you where maybe my, and it's a question of words. My problem arises that this is exactly what the universe is according to Einstein's theory of geology. Your relativity, it's unlimited and bound. Yeah, bounded. So yes, yeah, is, quite true. Is that what you mean, like the surface of, you know, the reality is in a four dimensional surface, but the yeah, surface yeah. of a uh, sphere is unlimited and bound? Is that the kind of. You may put it into that context, but I'm not. I know, that's why I'm having. Do you see <laughs> why my mind is kind yes, of yes, freaking yes. out? Yeah, and, that is Einstein, yeah, unlimited yet bounded. Okay. Right, because uh, um, light is curved, and therefore yeah. there must be an enclosed universe within which all space must return. I mean, all light must return Question. since it bends. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Are you saying infinitely extended or infinitely extendable? Well, whatever it is, it is unlimited. Now, we haven't decided whether it's power, energy, space, or time. Just that it's, as it is, it's unlimited. 
That's the first thing can be said about it. Hmm? So in other words, if I had an infinite lifetime and I started walking around the earth, okay, let my me path would be infinitely extended and finitely bound. Okay, let me take you through the reason. All right. Um, if we want to assert that there is something called the one, all right, would you agree, for the way we reasoned before, that what we mean by it is it cannot in any way entail a manyness? So you mean if I get immersed in the one, I'd be infinitely extended in the one, but I'd be finitely bound by it? I don't know. Would you agree that? <laughs> no, no, no. See, so you put three things in there. I would be finitely bound by it. Oh, if I was and I wanted to take that third okay. thing out of there. Okay, I understand what you're doing. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. So in pure thought, see, I want to take out anything unnecessary. If there is such a thing as a one, then it cannot be a many. All right. If it cannot be a many, then would you agree you can never regard it as a whole? For any whole must have a sum of parts. Agree? All right, would you go further and say, therefore, you can never regard the one as a part? Because a part presupposes a manyness. That is, it is part of a sum of things called a whole. For a part only has a uh, meaning in respect to a whole, and a whole always has a number of parts, and therefore it presupposes that. Would you agree, then, if it can either be said to have a whole or a parts, then anything that can be described uh, as a whole or parts uh, would not be applied to the idea of the one. Agree? Let us then try and proceed. Would you agree then if anything we said had a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? a beginning, a middle, and end, those would be distinctions you'd be making in something, and therefore you couldn't therefore attribute those kinds of ideas to the one. But if you cannot say it has a beginning or an end, then it must be That's the sense in which it's derived. So not because of Einstein or physics or any other consideration, but strictly by a dialectic. Did, did you just conclude that the one is infinitely extended? And no. no. I just said so far that drawn from this, you cannot say it is limited. Okay, Therefore, so it must be unlimited. Okay, it's, it's, the one is unlimited. That's all. So far, we can go further and see what else we cannot den well, we I must deny. To, I, I did hear you say something about a boundary. So yeah. It's unlimited and yeah. bounded. Now, when, now I want to go back. Now that we have unlimited, all right. All right, would you agree we are talking about something, the one, that is unlimited? Well, to that, that degree, it's not anything else. And in that respect, I have isolated it from everything else. Right. Bounded! <laughs> that sounds pretty arbitrary to me. Well, <laughs> why, of, of course. Well, I, look, if it if there is something that is unbounded, we are talking about something unbounded. We're talking about something unlimited, right? Unlimited. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's a boundary around that idea. Mm -hmm. But then, aren't you just basically saying that when you speak about it, Anything. the mere fact of speaking about it, Put puts, you've defined it then. Defined it. Defined Quite true. Sure. And that defined, defined it, that's right, the, define, the defining it creates a boundary. Yes. Yeah. So when I said unlimited, bounded. That's quite true. Mm. So unlimited is a bounded concept. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, now, uh, did you see how we generated from that this? Now let's go further. There's something very curious about this idea of being, all right? And that is, uh, we can speak about it, we can speak about this idea of being, as therefore being unlimited, permanent, right? But look here, you see, uh, if it has some motion in the way in which we described it a moment ago, a moment ago logical motion, right? Uh, 
we can then say, is it possible, is it possible for this thing um, with motion, it either moves somewhere else, it either moves to a place in which it is not, or it stays where it is and rotates upon itself at some point, for those are the kinds of motions there are. Well, we can't say that it can move to some other place because that would presuppose there are other places in which it can move, and that would be a manyness. We can't say then that it can move in some other place, or even if it stays upon a point, there has to be a point upon which it rotates, and there has to be a point upon which it rotates. That's another thing, and that's a manyness. Is it possible then that there's this kind of motion? That is to say, it can know itself. If it can know itself, then that's the kind of being that can turn upon itself. That's the Greek word for usia. The trouble with that word is that it is often translated with the word essence. And we do not mean, um, very few people know what they mean when they use the word essence, unless they mean by it something that is intrinsic to a thing. But that's not what this is. This is the capability of something on its most fundamental level turning upon itself and knowing itself or recognizing itself. And that is a kind of motion different than the other kinds of motion we just described. Now it's that kind of, right, that kind of thing we're calling being. Now there's another Greek word, onto, right, to, or, or toon, right, which is also which is also given the word being. And that's the problem. These two, some, these two in English are often interchanged, and that causes a great deal of problem. When we're going to use the word turning upon itself, when being is able to turn upon itself, know itself, we're going to use the word usia because we don't have an English word for that. And I will occasionally use the word essence in, high, you know, in, in uh, bracketing. Okay, now. The being that he's talking about is usia here. Or the motion is this here, which can when I talk about being as being permanent, always the same, never any change in it in any respect, eternal, right? Then we're talking about the word being. But what is the Greek word? Toan. Oh. Um, we get ontology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From where we get that's right, ontology. Ontos. Right. Being. Right. right. Ah, on, ontos, right, ontology. Yeah, from the Greek word ontos, right. Question? Yeah. Is, so then is unlimited bounded self-knowledge being? Pardon me? Unlimited bounded self-knowledge is being? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, that gives the possibility of self, of, uh, of knowing oneself if we have that kind of being. Okay. All right, okay, now. I just wanted to go back to that one line I had and work backwards tonight. Um, Now, in this game of metaphysics, we want to see where we put that essence. We want to see where to put that essence. Now, I'm going to use this word essence simply because the text often does. Right? Now, what he is saying is that this being or essence stands, as it were, between the one and soul. Now, that's called a middle position. Right? That's a middle position. 
And as such, this triad, therefore, is impartable. Because as the one, as the seer relates to the one, in the highest sense, you can't say you can break it up into parts. When you talk about in respect to the soul, you're talking about the soul in respect to a one soul. Now, anything that exists, anything that exists in our everyday world, when we talk about existence, we're talking about this lower one, because everything that's said to have existence has some kind of essence, and that's between, therefore, if it's living, right? every living thing is said to, therefore, have some kind of soul, some kind of essence, and it must be related to some kind of body or bodies. And if that's the case, this, this, uh, if it therefore is in this middle position between these two, which we'll explain in a minute, then we can talk about it being partible or capable of being in parts. Now, if it is over here, then Usia is, Usia is an image of the one. In respect to it, Usia in respect to the soul, then Usia is the paradigm of the soul. Now, I want to now jump into, uh, we can have some fun with the implications of this. Um, um, a paradigm is that from which everything else can be said to be derived like in a declension, all the ways in which something can be said to be developed, executed. It's a paradigm. Now, we already had a shot at this but I'd like to go back to it just for a moment. Right. Essence is something that has come into existence, come to get, come into being, right? It's come into, I use the word existence, not in terms of physical things, because its parents, as it were, were the bound and infinity. And when it's bound, when he talks about it as when the bound overcomes the infinite, then, then that's completely focused, it's completely focused, and therefore the idea of sameness develops. You can then use the idea of sameness. When infinity, he calls it uh, vanquishes, he calls it vanquishes uh, or overcomes or is in some parts of the universe exhibits its power to such a degree, then you can say then that uh, uh, difference emerges. Because when the infinite then is no longer contained by anything, there's nothing but a vast difference. Therefore, the idea of difference and sameness emerges when the infinite, therefore, gains access over the bound. Now, notice what we're doing. We're trying to talk about how certain ideas can come into existence metaphysically. That's all we're doing. Right? And um, we're going to use that. Now, we now can talk about, as we did a moment ago, we can talk about being as Usia. That's predominant permanency, right? 
we can talk about it as capable of this action and a being which then is capable of being in parts, partible, remember? Now, when these two, when these two come together and mix, and they normally can't be mixed because the particle and the impartible can't be mixed, it is mixed with usia. It's forced. The result of this mixture, that's given the word soul. That's what soul is. That's all it is. It is a new word. All we're doing is saying, since we said there is this, and said we saw that there could be this, when the two combine, mixed up, that's soul. That's all we mean by soul. Therefore, there's a part of soul which is permanent, which is capable of knowing itself, which can't be broken into parts, and a part of soul which, in fact, is in time. This can be in time. This permanency means eternity or eternal, right? That's an eternity. And therefore, in the soul, there's something in it that is eternal, and there's something, therefore, that is subject to change. Now, the soul is said to have three things. You can talk about soul in three ways. So let's break this up so that we can then talk about it. This is soul, three things. And let me bring you to it. Right. It has an osea. It has an usia, a capability of turning around itself. It has a certain power, and it has a certain energy. Because it derived those, would you not agree, from that vast power, the infinite power that was there. So the infinite power that was there, that, it's in, that is its inheritance, and being bound. All right. Now, what do we mean by power of the soul? That means all the ways in which it can know. All the ways it can know. That's a power. All the ways in which it can know. Energy is all the ways it can move in motion. Right? Ordered motion. Ordered towards anything. Anything it can admit of stages, it can go through them in stages because it has that capability. Therefore, soul has, let's take out the other words we had in here before, get rid of the eternal and change. It therefore has what we call the essence of soul is generated in three. That's called its triple essence. But usia, as we know, is something very interesting. Now we want to talk about it. Remember what we said about usia. It is that part, it is that capability of the soul or the mind to turn upon itself and know itself. That means there must be something in it, right? There must be something in it that allows a fullest flowering. All right, fullest flowering to emerge. It means, therefore, that in that, in this motion, as it were, in this turning about, it must move with such perfect harmony. What do we mean by harmony? A measured measured motion, appropriate to the circumstances, completely appropriate to the circumstances. And since it knows itself, right, since it knows itself, it knows itself that it knows itself. Therefore, based in here is also basically idea or form. 
Now these three things, these three things, are the way in which usia can be said to function in the soul. What does it do? Well, in knowing itself, there's a fully, flour fully flowering outcome of its total activities. There's a harmony in its very nature. And in that knowing, in that fullest knowing, it then has the, I must grasp the form of what it is in itself and express it in some idea. That's the soul in respect to the osea. Therefore, there are three parts of the osea. These are not parts as partible parts. This is the way in which it functions when it knows itself. Now, since it now can function in, from two realms, it now, we can say, to the degree that it is in man, Notice what it does. It now can use all of the ways it can know and seek to satisfy all of those things, and it does so by seeking, therefore, to know all things. Now, what that means? That means, necessarily, remember we said that, that uh, it's in, the particle is in time. Therefore, it can know all things in time. That means it can, know it, in, it can know it incrementally. Why is that? Because it means, therefore, that kind of a soul is generated in such a way that it can always be involved in coming to be, right? In coming to be, it can know whatever it is that's coming to be. because it's unable to receive the whole of being at any one time. And therefore, it approaches things sequentially. But if it turns, if it turns upon itself, then it can know itself as a whole. And in that respect, it receives the whole of being, which is then said, remember what we said a moment ago? By heavens, that's in the... Uh, uh, being as, as we see as eternity. Therefore, the simultaneous, the simultaneous grasp of all being right, is to know oneself in respect to one's being. When that, therefore, with the simultaneous grasp of all beings, that's another way of talking about eternity. Right? Because when you know things partially, you're knowing things sequentially, you're breaking them up. Therefore, we can say that uh, if we are here, if all creation started here, ends here, wherever we are in that timetable, right? we know things sequentially. Right? And therefore, we can see, because we're not able to receive the whole of being, right? where the whole of being is not simultaneously shown to us. Therefore, it's parceled to us, and we grasp it temporally, unless you do this, which is also the, uh, uh, this, of course, is uh, Arjuna's experience of Ishvara and uh, Bhagavad Gita, right? where he sees time and all of its majesty as a, and its totality simultaneously as a one. That's the same thing. That's the same thing. Are you saying there are two, two ways of functioning? Because I heard you say yes. it's unable to receive the whole of being. In time. respect to when it's turned to time and becoming. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the simultaneous grasp of all being. Is when it turns to itself. But then how can that be eternity if eternity is in time? Eternity is not in oh, time okay. because, remember, this is eternity, this is in time. The soul is a mixture of the two. Oh, okay, thank you. Right. Right? So mixture then, of the two. So then it could have a temporal experience of eternity. Well, that's what time is. 
Time is a moving image of eternity. Yeah. Yeah, right, 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 right. And it receives its power of existing from its uh, being as a seer. Now, let's see if we can go a step further. Right? Uh, this is, I'll come later. Good, here we go. The soul is not whole? Wholly real. It's not completely real. One part of it is, is total, the other part is partial. <laughs> That's both. That's why man can be magnificent in one moment and be a clown the next, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> yeah. Except for my Uncle Louis, who was able to maintain a certain level of existence beginning to end. <laughs> Please. <laughs> We normally reverentially bow when we think of Uncle Louis. <laughs> All right, look okay. yeah. One soul, therefore, right, of the two parts, right, then Plato says, this then must be broken up, parceled out, must be parceled out, be broken up into pieces, and these pieces, therefore, are going to be extended throughout the universe. So he takes one part, and the ratios of them are one, two, Four, eight, uh, three, uh, six, three, nine, twenty-seven, and uh, and then between each two intervals, he puts two analogies, two proportions, uh, arithmetic and geometric. And therefore, he can then take this, this one, and this one, and he bends them together, bends them, fastens them together. Right? And then this is called the same, and that's called the other. And then along the one, it's at a certain angle, which therefore, all of these listings therefore allow us to put the position of the planets, and he allows that. These are also the musical intervals of the Greek, Greek, Greek diatonic scale, as you know. And I just want to mention that in passing because I want to move on to something more interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. So that means then, that means then that built into the soul is number, ratios, right? measure, Analogy, proportion, because then the soul then is extended throughout the universe, and since it's extended throughout the universe as a whole, he then makes the statement that uh, the soul, actually, uh, soul cannot exist without body, and in soul, there has to be reason. And therefore, in the creation of this universe, he's going to have something then that extends throughout the entire universe, spread out through everything. It has reason within it. Soul encompasses it and take, can take on a bodily form wherever it's required. Right. Those are, yeah. um, I was reading that the other day, and... He says he constructed reason within soul and soul within body, and that's the word deuce. And that's the word what? It's nous in the Greek. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I'm used to that translated as intellect. Reason threw me off. I thought reason was dianoia. Well, uh, dianoia is usually translated as understanding mm -hmm. through nous, through dianoia, through understanding. Uh, but you're quite right. Uh, this is not ration. This is not in the sense of rationality. 
it's in the highest sense of reason in that respect it takes on the word intellect really mm -hmm. but uh, so remember there are two parts two parts of the soul there's the higher and the other therefore one part there's news and the other part there's opinion but we'll, we'll move into that in a moment all right okay then Based, therefore, in the universe, right? necessarily, therefore, the soul must in, inherently have the capability, since it's, it's uh, generated this way, for number, ratio, measure, analogy, and proportion. question this is kind of a they sometimes call the study of the soul or eschatology uh, because the soul has the two parts one in time and one not right therefore and it views it views uh, becoming be, views becoming <clears throat> because it's made up of the two parts what are the two parts again right see right the Osea, which is capable of knowing itself, and the being, which is capable, therefore, of having the powers to know all existing things in time. This is an eternity, or eternal, and this is in time. So, uh, we have an analogy. Let's see if I can get the analogy here then for you. Um, well, actually, it's going to take me a moment to do that. So let, let's let's do it the other way. Okay. Um, your question is: Why is there a need for the for body to exist, given the existence of soul? Mm -hmm. Right. So, not so. You think I dropped your your question? I don't. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Now we're to do that. Let's go into theology. All right. In theology, Plato starts with this statement. It's an analogy. Being what we've been talking about is to becoming, as truth is to believe. Now, being relates to truth, and therefore it can be known by logos or intellect, and phronesis, which is uh, the highest kind of knowing as becoming can be known by opinion and all of our perceptions. Therefore, you can make statements about it that you can call beliefs. Therefore, becoming is to belief as being is to truth. Now, being, therefore, he's going to add, he's going to say it's self-identical, uniform, uh, non-changing, right? Eternally what it is, right? <clears throat> Now, I want to take these two together, being hyphen true, right? becoming opinion, or belief, right? known through logos or reason and uh, wisdom, known by opinion and sensation or perception. Now, I'm putting that down first. Now, I want to talk about these two. I want to talk about these two. I want to talk about the realm of being and the realm of becoming. Now we're moving into theology. When God saw, when God saw that everything was in disorder, he desired that all should be like himself.
And so what he did then, what he took over the visible, which was in flux and disorder, and he produced, therefore, order out of disorder. This is not a creator. This is an organizer. Right? There's nothing created in this. If you mean by creation something that comes out of nothing. So he desired that all should be like himself, and this is called the supreme originating principle of the universe. After he desired that, he reflected. He reflected on this, right? He reflected on becoming now, because he now put it into order. Right? It's now ordered. It's now ordered. And now he's reflecting on what he's doing. And he says, you know what? Comparing holes with holes, those holes which are by nature rational are always more beautiful than the holes that can be regarded as irrational. And since beauty is one of the standards in this process, because order and beauty are kin, right, he therefore brought order into the out of disorder and necessarily brought beauty into existence. Why? Because in terms of this theology, God cannot do any action other than what is most beautiful. Therefore, when he brought order out of disorder, he necessarily brought it into a beautiful order. Therefore, when he compared holes with holes, he saw that the rational was more beautiful than the irrational. And because of that, because of that reasoning, aha, see, because of that reasoning, he put reason in soul and soul in body. Now, that means, therefore, the model for this universe, the model, he desired that all things should be like himself, therefore becoming must be like being. Then this must be the pattern, this must be the copy. This must be eter in eternity, as it were, remember, simultaneous whole. This must be in time. Therefore, when God then created the universe, spread it out through all becoming, this is the universe. This then is the universe. And therefore, he made it into a cosmos, which then becomes a living creature endowed with soul, owing to the providence of its maker, God. So if the universe is like, right, if the universe is like the pattern, where the copy stands to a pattern, therefore, when we, watch now, all right? Therefore, when we function, we then are similar to our creator, and we have to bring order out of our disorder, and it must be done fairly, beautifully, right? It must have a beauty to it, right? No coercion, right? And in doing that, we are, we are nothing other than doing within ourselves and our universe what God did to the universe as a whole. Therefore, we become, as it were, an element of the divine in respect to what we need to bring into order, out of the disorder, and therefore we are copying the very processes of creation of the uh, cosmology. Therefore, it is its realm. Right. Pardon me? Is this God the same? This God is not the one. This is more like no. a demiurge. This is called the demiurge. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Demiurge, it's a God that works. Ergos, right? It's a demigod. God that works. And um, so that uh, we can then see, therefore, that this model or this pattern is being, and it stands to truth, and everything we say about this, we can say is true, and everything we say about this universe that was our creation, the best we can say about it is in the realm of opinion, necessarily, because it's in time. You never see the whole, it's always a partable. And the primary vehicles for understanding it are 
uh, opinion and sensation or perception. So, <clears throat> this pattern now, this pattern therefore must be, must be not dead, but alive. It must have a vitality. Right? It must have a vitality. And it's also, obviously, since it's do-making and doing all of these creative things, there is evidence, therefore, it must have intellect. Right? So there's a living intellectual thing that exists, sometimes called a uh, intelligent living creature. This, therefore, is called the intelligent living creature because it has a vitality to it, an intellect about it, right? and it has its own possibility of knowing, right? turning upon itself. Therefore, this then is a copy of it, and therefore this becomes, this is the realm where we are and all other living creatures. This must then include all intelligent living creatures or all intellectuals. Or, put it in another way, the, the vital intelligibles. The primordial basic patterns of all that is has a life and a vitality. And this is sometimes also called the forms. Forms or forms, forms. Yeah. 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 Now, in order for this becoming, this universe to come into existence, right, it has to be made visible, right, has to be made visible, has to be made tangible, right? And he said, well, the principle of visibility is um, light or fire. And the principle of anything tangible is earth. So therefore, necessarily, uh, to, for that universe to come into existence the way in which it has come into existence, to be visible and tangible, necessarily the, prim prim the primal elements must be fire and earth. And two things, of course, cannot be joined without a third because you need something to bind them together. And whenever you have two things bound with a third, that's a mean analogy. And when you have um, a three-dimensional space, you need four terms, not three. And therefore, between these, he introduces two others, water and air. Now, they are principles. They're not fire and earth and water and air. Right? But it is whatever it is that makes things visible, whatever it is that makes things tangible, whatever it is that makes things fluid and moving in a flow, right? whatever it is that can bring things into a vitality, air, therefore these are the primary so-called elements understood in their sense rather than our own. They stand to one another in analogies. And he has two sets of them. Right? So air is to water as fire is to air, water is to earth as air is to water. What does that mean? It means that all of the basic primal elements or basic fundamental principles are brought together into an analogy which means they're harmonized. And if they're harmonized, they're harmonized not only because they're put in an analogy but they're created in such a way they can fit into an analogy, therefore, by necessity, they are harmonized. And that, therefore, allows us to say these things brought the current universe into existence. Now, let's see if we can, uh, I'd like to read something for you first. Um, he talks about this in two series of 
uh, analogies, a uh, three-term and a four-term analogy. And the most beautiful of bonds is that which most perfectly unites into one both itself and the things which it binds together. And to effect this in the most beautiful manner is the natural property of analogy. Therefore, analogy is a fundamental bond. Right, all this, it's a bond. It's brought together, harmonized, and brought together. It is a bond. It's a fundamental bond that keeps everything in analogical relationships, and therefore in analogical relationships, therefore keeps them in such a way that can be said to be harmonized with one another in the most beautiful possible way, and therefore the infinity, which is the behind all of the infinitude of forms, and the uh, infinite power of the universe can be then said to have its counterpart, the bound. The bond shows itself in analogical constructions. The major terms for the analogical constructions come out of what appears to be necessary given a metaphysical universe in which man can then be brought to know. Let's see if we can see that now. Matter of fact, let me read it for you, okay? Out of my big book. Maybe I'm not going to do it for you. Ah. Now, when he uses the word science in this translation, um, they didn't know what sciences were in our sense of the word. It was anything, therefore, that was intellectual, that had a sound principle for the way in which its parts were ordered and it had an ordering function, right? It's not our sense of the word science, which is something objective, something that uh, observers independently can verify that has empirical properties, et cetera, et cetera. Since the sciences which are in us, see all the ways of knowing, all the ways of knowing are called collectively the sciences in Plato. Since also the sciences which are in us, some look to one object of knowledge, such as medicine, some to health, but others extend to many, as arithmetic, to philosophy, to politics, many others. And this is not only the case with arithmetic, but also with the measuring science and with statistics. Pardon me, statics. For Plato says that either all or some of the fabricative arts require the assistance of these, and without these, no accuracy. But others look to all the arts and to the contemplative sciences as is the case with divining art, says Plato. Well, I like that, but that isn't the quote I wanted. Yeah, I, I do that sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, hmm. Gee, it's not that far. Yeah. Ah. For it appears to me on this account that Plato constitutes the soul from the first genera and from numbers, ratios, harmonic ratios, 
and likewise that he places in it the principles of figures, divine motions, in order that by causally comprehending the reasons of all disciplines and of dialectic, it might thus know all things, the essences, the numbers, the harmonies, the figures, and the motions of which wholes consist. It seems likewise that he constitutes the soul as being allied to intelligibles from the genera of being, which primarily subsist in them, but that he gives figures to soul as being allied to sensibles. For things which are truly figured are sensibles, and that as being a medium between intelligibles and sensibles, he binds it with harmonic ratios, though in intelligible forms also, for they are the form of harmony and the form of figure. So. Within us, therefore, right now, this is taking off now. So within us, therefore, are these things built within the soul itself, and that allows us, therefore, to comprehend the reasons for all the disciplines, all the things we want to know, and the dialectic, and thus we can know all things. For we can know all things because the very things that we need to know them are built within the nature of the soul. Thank you. That's what I wanted to do tonight. Quite right. But I missed that. No, you didn't miss it. I mean, you might have missed it in another sense, but since I didn't state it, you missed it in another sense. Okay. One is considered one is considered the highest concept of a god. But in the Platonic world, there are other kinds of gods. There's also a god that is a pure being, intellect. Now, uh, when they talk about a pure being, they also talk about it as a primal being. Um, and this pure being, <clears throat> therefore, has a... Uh, intellect right, and a vast vitality and it is of the necessity of this thing now here's what we're going to call pure being right? here we're going to call vitality here we're going to call it intellect just to represent it Now, in this, in this interesting game, <clears throat> um, how, does, how does the first creation take place? See, the first creation has to be the idea in the mind of God. The creator. Because you can't have any creation according to what we were doing before you have a model. That model, right, remember? Um, um, the beautiful concept that he, he uh, wanted everything to be like himself, modeled after himself. Therefore, there must be an idea of himself in the mind of God. Right? Now, when the, this is, uh, uh, Plato doesn't express this fully, uh, 
Plotinus does in, in a very beautiful way. He puts the whole thing in terms of process. Plato puts it in terms of structure. So Plotinus sees the one as overflowing out of its fullness. There's a nat natural overflowing of itself, returning to itself. At the moment, no, at this returning to itself, with intellect, therefore, it must in some way recognize itself. Knows. Right? And knows that it is. And that it has turned upon itself. Well, that means, therefore, that must involve, knows that it is being. Right? It has turned upon itself must turn, that means there must be a vitality that allows it to turn upon itself, to see itself, knows and recognizes itself. Therefore, there must be intellect. Therefore, this must be overflowing and turning around and returning to itself. Now, that, metaphysically and theologically, is being. That's being. All right? That's being. So being is part of the one. While you can say it's, it's not part of a one, when you take the idea of the one as a process, then you can talk about it this way. And at that moment of turning around and seeing itself, you can now call that being. What we remember that's who see it, turning upon itself, knowing itself, right? Now, <clears throat> um, um, this then, this then is, <laughs> now we're going to go poetic a bit, right? But therefore, therefore, this is the idea, capital I, this is the pattern, this is the idea of God has of himself in creating the universe. Now, <laughs> pardon me. Ah, good, thank you, thank you. Now, try this now. Um, there's, there's not, so to talk about it this way, we really mean that being isn't dead. It's really being primarily, but it also has uh, a vitality and an intellect to it. So we can talk about this part of being as the intellect of pure being. We can talk about this part of it as being the vitality of pure being. Right. We can, right? In other words, we can make three distinctions in one repeating itself. Therefore, in the same way now, we can talk about intellect. There's a being to being. There's a being to intellect. And there's a vitality of intellect, and there's also the highest aspect of intellect and intellect. By the way, in the same way this can overflow and turn upon itself. Soul! You, you that question. I know what you're See? Then you take the same drama with the same elements. Another generation <laughs> created things. So, so they're practically universe now. Yeah, 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 frankly, yeah. So, all right? Hi. Hi. I heard you talk about soul in two ways. I heard you talk about soul itself and also soul in body. Yes. And I thought I heard you say that soul must be in body or must somehow that's part of 
part of how it defines itself, that it, that it participates, or that the body, it's in the body. But I thought that soul, its soul was that, that which the body entered into. Or I thought it was the other way around, so maybe you could explain. <laughs> Is it both, depending on what model you're looking at? Um, well, um, when the body drops away from the, the soul, the soul's still there in its entirety. It doesn't change. It's totally permanent. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you talk about soul in that way, the body is falling away from it. Yes. But when you talk about it the way you talked about it tonight, the soul is inhabiting the body or it's in the body. That's the part that seems contradictory. Because it's a cosmology, right? Well, um, I'm not sure whether there are two ways of dealing with this. One is to say that um, when we were talking about um, this idea, right? In man, that's man's intellect, right? And but well, let me let me ch change that. Uh, this generation is soul of the universe. And it's throughout the entire universe. And therefore, for Plato, the whole universe, much like a body, much like our own body, when we touch any part of it, there's a communication that goes throughout the whole of it. For Plato, therefore, the whole universe is a living entity that knows itself wherever it experiences, whenever, whenever it experiences. So there's communication in the entire universe for, for the Plato's world. So you're asking, I think, the next question was, how do you go from soul in general to particular souls such as you and I? Right, and you talk about it as soul in body, or is it the body that's sitting there with soul around it or through it? Well, in the same way that wherever you touch yourself, there has to be for that same analogy to fit. Therefore, wherever you touch, you f and immediately feel, therefore, throughout the whole must be that sense of a soul. And therefore, one of the Platonic yogas is the separation of the soul from the body is by drawing it together from all parts of the body into a unity outside of the body. And therefore, the body therefore can uh, uh, be shallow in that sense, and the soul takes a trip. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just. Um, you mentioned uh, Plotinus. Yes. Unpack Plato. I was wondering um, is it that Plotinus is, has such a rich. And how? You know, it's like, who's more packed, Plato or Plotinus? <laughs> well, you see, what's nice about Plato, and I think it's absolutely unique in history, is that um, Socrates had a Plato. Plotinus had Porphyry. Jesus had Paul. <laughs> see, and... Uh, it's because of Porphyry, who was the, the court stenographer, as it were, for Plotinus, that it's a condensation of dialogues. So it is a very, very heavily uh, condensed work. Uh, but I think I was using that idea with Proclus more than I was with, with Plotinus. See, Plotinus is easier to unpack because they are assertions that are being made again and again and again that take on a logical sequence. In Plato, you don't have that. You have threading. You have to pick up an idea here and here and there and bring them together into unities. To understand Plato is to exercise understanding. To know Plato is to become Platonic. That's why people of Aristotle, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is quote him, and every, wherever he is quotable, there's a sentence that came before it and after it that follows, and you, it's easy to lecture upon, it's easy to talk about. 
but for the time is, there's so much threading. Like I only took care of, you know, a couple of pages of the time is. <laughs> but uh, Proclus has those two volumes. So, but I do agree with you. Plotinus really does. <laughs> He's similar to Proclus in that sense. But I think Plotinus is more interested in processes and uh, the psychology of man. He's interested in, in the realm of experience. He wants to bring man in uh, intellectually, yogically, and Proclus is interested in creating a great synthesis of all previous thinkers into a whole. So I, I, so, I don't know. Good question. Uh, since the soul is a, is a composite, um, uh, part of which is part of which is eternal, mm -hmm. part of which is non-eternal, mm -hmm. then the soul. Then uh, I would take it that the soul of the universe is uh, eternal yes. and exists in time. Yes. And that. Um, yes. And so the, the part that exists in time is mm -hmm. the part that we that we we experience as yes. the, the maybe I would, I would want to say something more than the seasons, but the changing yeah. the changing yeah. the change or the uh, that we see have occurring before mm -hmm. us is the is the impermanence of yeah. the soul. That's right. That's right. That's what he's saying. See. What he's doing is really interesting, I find. That is, that he takes man's condition and he takes all the possible experiences man can have and then he works backwards and says, well, given what we are, what does that presuppose? What does that presuppose? What does that presuppose? What system must I create in order to bring all of that into a unity? So he works. Or he gets a great insight and works forward. I imagine he does both. Does he talk about the possibility of having a body without a soul? Uh, See, here you no, for him, an, no. Anything that has a soul has to have vitality. But I'm saying the other way around. But is it possible to have a body without a soul? Yes, but it would be dead. Mm. Well, by body, I'm, I'm talking about, let's say, an electron. I'm not... Oh! I'm, not, I'm, I'm oh. just saying, that is it possible, oh. according to his... electron? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've always thought an electron no. must have a soul, you know, I'm just... Well, he would say, if, if motion, right, if it's going somewhere, if it has a direction, right, then you have to assume its direction is either meaningful or not. To, the, to whatever degree it fits into a pattern, there, to that degree it's influenced by the pattern. Therefore, on some level, it has to have some kind of intellect functioning. Could I say my therefore? Please, please. Therefore, on some level, it is self-reflexive. I mean, I always look at, since yeah. I look at it in terms of mathematics, yeah. uh, um, see in terms of recursion and self -reflexive. Yes, it is recursion. Oh, yes, it's golden section. Are you familiar with that God particle thesis? Very yeah. okay. little, but mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm familiar yeah. with Yeah, that's, what, that's anyway. the point he's saying. Yeah, yeah that's, your point is what he's making. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a, uh, trouble with this for a while. Mm -hmm. He took over the visible region and he saw that it was in a state of discordant and disorderly motion. No, he, no, right? no, 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 no. He took over what was disordered. Mm -hmm. And in motion, not at That's rest. That's right. Uh -huh. Yes, it was disordered, not at rest. Yeah, what does that mean? I don't, I don't, I don't understand I don't know. that. Like, I, I view the, the 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 moving universe every single day, and it seems yeah, to possess a true. hell of a lot of order to me. Yeah, I agree. Cause with and effect. Yeah. But yeah. you look at the cause. Place. Yeah, that's right. You're quite so right. how how is it disordered? You were I think he's talking about different things. He's doing the game of in the beginning. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, everything was disordered, and he brought it into order. Also, isn't he quoting Hesiod? I mean, don't we have to take it within yeah. the cosmogony, sure. the Greek sure. cosmogony, yeah. that yeah. in the beginning was chaos? Yeah, have chaos. And God, out of the chaos, brought forth cosmos, order. which is the order. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't get it. Beginning chaos. When did that? When did those happen? When? He wants to know why chaos is first. Empty. I um, or if it was first, what is it, and when did that happen? I don't. Okay, don't that's absolutely. Look here, look here. You have an absolutely good question. There's nothing wrong with it, right? What you want to know is how does he describe that original chaotic condition, other than saying it's disordered? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good question. He has a whole section on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I read that I'm book. glad he didn't ask for it. Whew, I got out of that one quick. I don't want to tell you now. <laughs> he talks about it by describing it in terms of gold, radiance, which is quite amazing that the, the, prim the primal condition of things may be disordered, but for him it has a vast luminosity to it. And that's in the time of... Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you for sharing. Thank you.